I have a story to tell, and the story that I want to tell was really driven by my wanting to present to myself and then to you uh, a vertical integration kind of idea, one that Bill uh, hit on yesterday. And the, and the end point here is going to be what's known as the High Frequency Environmental Acoustics Model Document, which is a, an applied product from APL um, that was published over the years. And I want to get to that end point, and I want to understand how we got to the ability of doing and getting to that end point. So I put the authors here in, in the order of their tenure. Terry wins by a landslide in that case. Um, but there's a lot of years of experience in, in uh, what I'm about to present. Some salient points here is first that APL was established by a University of Washington Physics Department chair. He had a certain scientific method um, that we all know about that, um, that he instilled on everybody in that first generation on hypothesis testing and quantitative modeling and combining uh, experiments and, and modeling, in our case, in the present context, acoustics. He was also really big on um, applied efforts motivating basic research and completing that loop. And I'm going to try to follow that thread, though I will tell you now I'm not going to do justice to everything that went on. Um, it's impossible to do that. So Joe Henderson is shown here. This is a painting by a guy named Tom Wells, who happened to be a drafter at APL UW and a very good artist. And I'm going to show you a picture, another um, picture that he did or, uh, at the end of the talk. So Joe was hired in 1929. At the time, the president of the university would actually go to the individuals and, and interview them and then hire them. And he was really hired so that he could bring the physics department into the modern age. Um, they didn't have a PhD program at the time, and there was little research. His research really aimed, before the war, at, at field emissions from, of electrons from metal. And Joe himself probably never did a lot of acoustics, per se, um, but the method that he taught was one that um, everybody uses. So in 1940, he was asked to go to DC and work uh, on better anti-aircraft weapons uh, to aid the British. And, and while he was there, uh, um, a guy named Oppenheimer came to him and talked to him about joining a Manhattan Project. But at the time, he knew nothing about, and they couldn't say what it was about. Um, so he declined because he had agreed to establish this university-affiliated uh, lab at the University of Washington. So he came back there, and his job the job that was given to APL at the time was to help out in the um, problems they were having on torpedo magnetic influence exploders. Now, this job and, and this effort um, resulted in what's known as the Mark 9, and it was really a joint effort between APL John Hopkins and APL UW. The fact is, is that Wilbur Ghost, who was the, who eventually filed the patent for the Mark 9, really graduated from the University of Washington Physics Department and had worked with Henderson, so there was a close connection there. Um, if you, I found this in, the, in actually a submariner uh, symposium that um, the statement was that there was convincing information that the Mark 9 exploder was used on April 7th in 1945 in the Mark 4, 13 torpedoes to sink the Japanese battleship Yamato and several other warships. Uh, it was interesting to me to note that there were 285 people working at APL at the end of the war, and that very quickly went down to 100, just like we heard everywhere. So Joe's problem was, how do we keep the lab going? So he went to DC alone, which was a mistake the associate directors found out, and, and he committed the lab to design underwater equipment to measure the blast from the nuclear we weapons test in Bikini at what were scheduled for July. So they had like three months. Um, and the job was simply to measure the pressure as a function of time underwater. But the primary question was, how were you going to trigger the system in order to record everything? And, and the Navy told Joe, look, don't worry about it. Los Alamos has you covered. They'll give you a radio trigger. So a, as a lesson for experimentalists, always be paranoid. 
and Henderson was. So he, had, he wanted a backup, and he put hydrophones between the main equipment and the blast so he would have a secondary triggering system. Turned out the Los Alamos trigger failed, the hydrophones worked, APL got the data. So at that point, APL had experience in torpedoes, and they had at least some sort of cursory experience in underwater sensor. And Joe used that to win the next big effort for APLUW. And that effort was to develop torpedo test ranges that included acoustic tracking. So, in 1952, uh, APL got uh, money to do a feasibility study for constructing 3D torpedo range in Daba Bay. Um, by January 1955, they'd done all the design engineering and construction and completed the test in Hood Canal, so they were good to go. So in 1956, they started um, constructing this uh, tracking range. So from 56 to 60, they constructed nine of these stations. Now this station, each station has four receivers and it has two transmitters that are transponders. Because there was no synchronized tracking, what you had to do was you had to fire to either the torpedo or to, to the target and, and then they would transpond so that you, you could do the ranging, right? The other interesting thing here is this is on a uh, U joints and had a float because they had to keep everything level to, to, to the ground because the computers at the time weren't fast enough to do the calculations if they started to get off kilter. So they spent a lot of time getting it to the point that they had a system that, that would work and stay level. Um, later, during this period of time, they did create a, a synchronized tracking system. But, but a key point here is that as they were doing this, the, the physicists in, in the effort started to try to understand what the torpedoes were doing. And they realized they couldn't understand what was going on if they didn't understand the environment. So that's a key piece. This is the Mark 45 torpedo. An Another key weapon, piece, it turns out, is that warhead. at the same time, APL, at UW, and Westinghouse designed what's known as the asteroid Exercise torpedo. Section. So again, here, what you see is we have the ability to, be, to build structures, and you have the ability to build systems that move through the water. So as part of that background, the basic research that was going on at the time, which is really applied research aimed at a, at a problem, um, produced these two articles. And these two articles, just like what Mosin said, it is amazing that as an institution, these two articles set the next 40 to 50 years. Um, one of them was on wave propagation in random media by Potter and Murphy. Murphy ended up being a director at APL from 1980 to 1987. This is in 1957. And the other was measurement of backscouting of underwater sound from the sea surface. The point of these are that they started a cycle where you tried to obtain quantitative understanding of the physics of acoustic propagation and scattering. And then you try to translate that understanding into answers to applied questions and to develop applied products. So this little circle continues, continues to this day, I would argue, and that is you go out, you do an experiment, you try to understand the models, you try to understand the environmental sensitivity, you do a few cycles of basic research, you learn something, you kick that out, you put that into the 6.2 or 6.3 or 6.4 world, in our case, in terms of understanding simulators and giving them simulators input, um, so, codes such as RevGen or SST or even PC SWAT down at Panama City, and we also produce this environmental acoustics models document. So this is really a cycle that continues today. So now, now we're at the point where we have these two basic themes. I'm going to follow the wave propagation and random medium first. So it turns out that um, one of the keys of having built a, a tracking system or a, is that now you have connection to that tracking range and you can use the electronics. So Terry actually used that to his advantage and at night they would take um, the electronics and they would plug it into their own equipment and they would do studies of wave propagation and random medium across Quilcene Bay. Now, the key to that is that, that we learned two things in the tracking range stuff. We learned how to build towers, that's useful, and we learned how to build torpedoes, that's useful. This is actually what I think is one of the first UUVs in the world. This, this is from a test 
1960, and you can't read the numbers, September 1960 of what's known as SPUR, which is, after all, just a torpedo with a different payload. And this thing was set up to measure uh, the temperature in the ocean. So this was a beginning of the environmental character characterization you needed to complement the acoustics. Um, later on, as a result of having studied that, what, what he found was that, that in the Russian literature, um, it had shown that, that Ritov theory was really not good if you had scintillation indices greater than one, and he measured those kind of indices much greater than one in Quilcene Bay. So he wanted to understand that further, and that resulted in this final experiment in this series known as MATE, in which you measured not only the acoustic scintillation at multi-kilohertz kind of ranges, but you also measured the oceanography, which is another theme of the lab. You have to measure the acoustics, you have to measure the environment. Um, in this case, they were about 20 kilometers apart. There's a source tower, there's two receiving towers, there's a moorings to measure what the oceanography looks like, and then though it may be hard that, to see, there's the spur that ran horizontally to get the horizontal part of the ocean spectrum variability. And what resulted was the data that's shown here. And the key was is that data, in addition to the data, they had the environmental characterization so they could drive a model quantitatively. And when they did a Ritoff model using that ocean data, they got very poor fit to, to, the, to, the, to the data. Um, kind of also in keeping with the idea if you do a good experiment, you can go back to it. Um, in later years, about 12 years later, they, they did an improved modeling capability, they had improved modeling capability, and they reproduced using the oceanographic data, a model data comparison that was very good. So let me jump from that to, to surface. So we've done the volume, I'm gonna start with the bottom. Um, our involvement really started with the Mark 50 uh, guidance system. And there was a need for high f fidelity reverber reverberation simulations in order to understand, again, torpedo guidance. Um, this started an effort that, that Daryl Jackson led. This is a very cool system. It's got a depressor, and down here is a Mark 46 head that could be panned and tilted so you could actually take data of backscattering all the way from 90 degrees to shallow grazing angles. That resulted not only in the experiment, but in a, in a modeling effort that tried to understand and predict the scattering from the bottom. So in that kind of modeling effort, what Daryl did was, was come up with two different effects that he knew he had to treat. And one was the interface roughness, which he um, models as, as a power law kind of spectrum. And you needed to be able to measure these pieces of the power law spectrum. And he had support to do that. And you also had sediment volume scattering from heterogeneities. Um, as a result of that, he, he was able to compare using measured values of roughness and one free parameter in volume scattering. Um, he was able to compare data and model. In this case, the data is a little above the model. Um, in the bottom case, uh, which is a finer silt kind of sand, there's a very good agreement, but there is a free parameter to deal with. Likewise, if you go to the surface, you can look at uh, some stuff, articles by Peter Dahl, in which case they look, Peter looked both in deep water and shallow water. And what he found again was if you, he did an experiment over 24 hours, the wind speed is in blue, the scattering strength measured at 20 degree grazing angle is in red, and if you just use the, the measured roughness, you would get the result here. So there is a disparity between model and data. So what does that mean? Well, what it really means is there's some other piece of physics you have to look for. And that piece of physics is bubble scattering. And what he showed is that for wind speeds of the type from above a few meters per second, that a, a surface scattering model would not work to, to um, predict the data. However, the blue data is as the wind comes up, red data as the wind goes down, not only do you see that you can model it, in this case correctly, using bu bubble scattering, but you can see this hysteresis effect due to the fact that the bubbles remain there after the wind event. So what all this means is that those are very three very particular examples from a score and many scores of experiments 
that went into developing this environmental acoustics models document. And I'm not here to show you all of the details here, except to say I've done a real disservice to a lot of different kinds of experiments that went in to develop this model or this code. The point being is that the idea was to transfer basic results into codable environmental inputs, and those kind of, these models are now used not only in the U.S., but in other countries for uh, mission planning analysis and for tactical decision aids. So I'm going to take one or two minutes to jump further, and, and my point here is that as we've went forward and got more sophisticated in acoustics modeling as a community, we've also had to get better at characterization. So in an experiment we did in the late 90s, we measured um, dispersion in the sediment, and, and not only the, the acoustics, but we had to get a hold of all the parameters needed for a very sophisticated porous medium model. My point is not to look at the details, but to say, look, there's a lot of parameters that you needed to measure, and not only do you need several acu acoustics institutions, but you also need several institutions that know how to do the characterization. And as a final example, um, this is from an experiment done, this is part of Shallow Water 06, in which um, there were simultaneous measurements of not only acoustic propagation, but of the oceanography, in this case nonlinear internal waves, over about a two kilometer path. So the internal waves were measured simultaneously to the acoustics, and what it allowed us to do was be able to look at the sound speed kind of in an instantaneous way, and use that sound speed profile in a model to try to understand the acoustic receive. I'm not going to point out too many details, except for there, there's a path here that touches the thermocline twice. And that path is this path right here. And the model is able, because we have this kind of, of, of contempt, uh, simultaneous measurements, um, able to predict the data very well. So at the end of the day, what is Joe Henderson's legacy? I think Stan Murphy said it probably the best. He said, Joe and, and the early members of the staff who came out of physics set a thought pattern and a particular philosophy that still exists. The attempt to think of fundamental processes, to be skeptical to a degree of asking, I think I know this, why do I know it? So Joe set us on this, this uh, path of applied needs, uh, motivating basic research. That's probably true of all of us. And I would argue all of us solve the same problem in different ways because uh, of both our personal formative years and our scientific formative years. And like people, I think institutions that we've heard in the last day and a half have that same thing. They've been formed by very dramatic people, people with large personalities, and those personalities have infused themselves into to our, our lives, into our scientific research. And, and in, in our case, it, it's really led us down this path of doing acoustics, doing environmental measurements, so that if you get disparities between models and data, you have to explain them. And then I'm going to end with this picture. This is by Tom Wells. And this is what you, happens when you give an artist the job of trying to picture and paint uh, a 3D range. So there you go. Thanks.